goings from each and every day of the Rugby World Cup. So sit back, relax, get some coffee or tea and enjoy what's coming up from day 13 of the Rugby World Cup. We had two matches take place. Argentina up against Tonga from Pool C and Ireland up against Italy from Pool D. Two matches that, should there be an upset, could prospectively be quite damaging to the other teams as two favourites up against two hopefuls. Lots to win, lots to lose for both sides. So we're going to have a look at these two games coming out of Group C and D. That is all we have for today. And again tomorrow we will have a couple more matches coming from the next day. Canada, Romania, Fiji, Uruguay. But first things first, let's get into the action. Just two matches today. So let's get straight to it. Argentina versus Tonga from Leicester City Stadium. The 27th match of the Rugby World Cup and the Tongans They were the ones who were the hopefuls. The Argentinians were the favourites and they were always the favourites to qualify second out of Pool C. But this was probably their toughest ask here to come up against the Tongans or the Georgians. One of those two had the potential to maybe cause an upset, but Argentina, a team that controls their game, how will they get on against the Tongans? The Tongans side, a frantic start from them. They are spreading the ball to all angles of the park. Width was their main priority, attacking and getting the pressure on their opponents. What they did well with the ball in hand, they did the opposite when they didn't have the ball in hand. Aggressive defense, hitting hard on the players, extremely big tackles, always seem to be bordering on a touch illegal almost with a few of them as well. Question marks were being asked and eventually that is what was giving them the Argentinians the chance to escape the early pressure that Tonga were creating. The high tackles, the penalties were giving the Argentinians an easy exit from their own area and when you have two high shots in the first three minutes of the match, when you're putting the pressure on as well, it doesn't do well for building that pressure up. Eventually though, it was the Tongans who scored first, the try going to Moraf, the fly half who scored the opening try for the Tongans, and that put them in the lead as well. Surprising, some may say, up against Argentina. It was 5-0, but it was all created by Vianu, a massive Vianu run. He is such a hard man to put down. Carried about three defenders with him as he almost went all the way himself. Quickly recycled ball straight out to Morant, and he just split the defense in half. The angled run, cutting in between the two defenders to score the opening try. Tonga hit the lead in the sixth minute, and they were on the board. The aggressive approach, though, continued to hurt the Tongans, although it was pretty obvious that was the game plan that they were going with, and that was how they were looking to upset the Argentinians with their physicality. But that did give the chance for Argentina to open their account, going with the penalties, all going to Sanchez in the 17th minute. Got them on the board. 5 3 was the score at that point. But despite that little piece of joy that the Argentinians got just after the quarter of an hour mark, it was all Tonga at the start. They were the ones putting the pressure on, they were the ones creating chances, and of course, they were leading the match. And the game plan was working until Tukalet scored possibly one of the best tries so far of the World Cup. An absolute outstanding try by Argentina. The ball was kept alive through plenty of offloads, just the support by the players keeping up with each other, backing up over and over again. That was one of the best first tries we've seen. The first try we've seen from Tukulet as well, just in the 20th minute, the game was back. The conversion made it 10 points to 5 in Argentina where they're back in control. But what happened next was even more outstanding. Just a minute or two later, another try straight off the kickoff. This one, I think, was almost better than the first. It was just such an impact kickoff straight to, I think, one of my favourite um, Argentinian players at the moment, especially in this World Cup. He's really grown on me, his ability, and that is Santiago Cordero. He is playing outstandingly in this competition. He took the kickoff 
B1 defender, scamper down the sideline, come up to a support, put the ball inside. The support was there from his outside backs and also his back row players. Eventually, it did go to ground as they consolidated through the middle. Then quickly, extremely quickly, recycled ball, found its way out to Arnimov, who stepped inside the sliding defence and went to width, and he scored a massive try just minutes after their first massive overlap wide. Arnimov was just too good, too hot, but it was all sparked from Cordero, who I think is really one of the best players to come from this World Cup, to really make a name for himself in this World Cup. He is proving to be a real, another really skillful winger for the Argentinians. And as you would expect, two tries in a couple of minutes is enough to really change the momentum of a match. Argentina, Argentina had their confidence up. Their forwards were now getting into the game. They were demolishing the Tongan scrum, and that was giving them a huge advantage through the rest of that first half. Penalties were exchanged between Sanchez and Marath, and in the end, just about before half time, it was 20 points to 8. The Argentinians with a nice lead going into the break, but just before we head to the halftime break, there's a couple of really big chances to go to the two sides. Argentina were first, they butchered an amazingly massive chance, two on one overlap, and they opt for the kick, which eventually dribbled into touch, beat them all over the line. It would have been a simple try, surely, if they kept the ball in hand. The kick not working in their favour. The other opportunity went to Tonga, and they took it with both hands. It went to the big front row of the loose head prop. Tonga Uiha, the 130 kg monster, but he just did the finishing touches as well as good hands from the big man, but it was all once again Vanu. Big busting run down the right hand wing, beating tacklers for fun. Eventually, as he was being bundled into touch, through the miracle offload inside, and Tonguia was right there for the support. Easy catch and the dive over for the big man who put the game back in the balance. 20 points to 13. Argentina's lead was cut down big time from that try. Tonga with a better side to come out of the halftime break though. They started to gain some dominance up front themselves after being on the back foot for a good portion of the latter part of the second half. They were getting the scrum penalties and Argentina, you could see on their faces, were really starting to get confused and frustrated as to how they had lost that dominance that they, you know, love to have in the forward pack. Although Argentina did get a bit of their own luck back the other way. Lavanini should have been sent to the sin bin for a big no arm shoulder charge tackle. Uh, it was almost unbelievable. It would seem like a gimme yellow card the way they've been dishing them out in this Rugby World Cup. But he did get away with it. And once again, it come down to the TMO, you know, pushing his way into the match and, you know, making the decision almost for the referees. And like he, the referee ultimately had the final say. Probably one of the few times I've seen a referee stand up and go, look, no, I don't agree with you. I'm not giving out a card for this. But Lavanini, I think, lucky not to get away, um, to get away with that, I should say, and not get a yellow card. The match after that point, though, around the Elmar got very, very scrappy and started to lose a lot of its structure. At that point, a few penalties were exchange either side and it was 26-16 Argentina's lead was 10 points but the penalties were really flowing all over the place Argentina nearly extended their lead as they got over the line after a massive amount of attack but were just held up in the corner of the TMO denying another try for Argentina but they did not let that affect them just minutes later it was Nicolas Sanchez who went straight through to score a great try. He beat his man on the outside for just pace, out and out pace, just blitzed him and slides in for a pretty easy try for Sanchez, who at that point became the top point scorer of the tournament. We've seen that exchange hands a number of times in the last few matches, but now Sanchez, as he scored that try, took that mantle back to Argentina. 
The Tongans obviously at this point is conceding that try, had nothing to lose. So they were throwing everything, including the kitchen sink, at the Argentinian defence. But they just could not put that final play away to score and put themselves back in the match. And with that, the frustration set in, the lack of composure set in to the Tongans. And they started to really lose their way. And that is when Argentina took control. Montoya, the scoring a try from the line-out short move, going to the front and then back to the hooker down the short side in front of the line-out and what a finish it was from the hooker, diving into the corner, planting the ball down it is something you see of the wingers not what you see from a hooker it was a great piece of play and that really put the game far beyond doubt it didn't finish there though for the Tongans as the man well my new favorite Argentinian player Santiago Cordero setting up tries himself earlier in the game gets one for his own name in the final minute of the match it was just a wide play two on one Cordero we know he's got the fanciest footwork in all of Argentina he was just too hot to touch and his two on one advantage didn't even need the man used him as bait threw the dummy come back inside stepped in off the foot and went in for the final try of the match in the end an absolute blowout going the way of the Argentinians Tonga I think they showed a lot of their capability but they just could not finish their plays. In the end, I even think the scoreline did flatter Argentina where it was before those last couple of tries, you know, around 30-16. Even that was probably too much for the Argentinians the way the match actually went. Tonga deserved probably a score a bit more, but through their own lack of you know, final abilities to get that last little piece out of the game was their downfall. Those last two tries, really just the results of throwing all the beans into one basket. And it did, well, ultimately go against them. But you win some, you lose some. Another day, Tonga could have scored two tries and it would have really been game on the other way. But Argentina showed they're good enough and showed that they are one of the better sides going around in this Rugby World Cup. The ability to just close their match out and put the pressure back where it come from show that they could be possibly a bit of a potential banana skin for the biggest sides in the knockout stages. So the final score there, 45-16, Tonga, disappointing finish. I think they played some of their best rugby in that match. You know, the time when they lost to Georgia, of course, that will be a really big disappointment to them. I think they should hold their heads up high for a good 60-minute portion of this match where they did, in fact, show some good signs against the Argentinians. The second match was up next, just two for this day of the Rugby World Cup, the 28th match, of course, coming out of Pool D, and very much like the Argentina, Argentina Tonga match, you know, Ireland and Italy, Six Nations rivals, Italy obviously always a team that really battles at the bottom against Scotland, but, you know, they've always got that ability that come that day, they might play their best, Ireland could have a shocker, Italy could possibly win this match. It was the Olympic Stadium for this one, a big one, I think, for this competition as well, for the World Cup, because it had the prospect. Ireland have been coasting nice and easy. They needed a bit of a tune-up before they faced a big one up against France this weekend. So Six Nations battle, but a big sign for Italy was they had their inspirational captain, Sergio Parise, back and number eight for the Italians. That could be the real incentive that they need to lift their game against the Irish because it has been an average World Cup. They nearly lost to Canada earlier on in the tournament as well. Italy, I think, will be satisfied maybe with how they've gone, but not happy by any stretch of the imagination unless they get a win here against the Irish. So the match kicked off and there was a lot of mistakes straight off the whistle for both teams. It was really just a penalty of thorns straight away and it wasn't until the seventh minute when Johnny Sexton opened up the account for the Irish 3-0. It was Ireland looking the better of the start, but Italy definitely holding their own in the early going to the match. Another six minutes later in the 13th minute, it was Tommaso Allen who replied back for the Italians. It was 3-3 and this match needed someone to rip it right open. And that's exactly 
what Ireland got. Keith Earls, he's been a revelation for the side. We know Keith Earls is good. He's been around for a long time, but he's really picked his time to hit some fantastic form. He scored the only try of the match. A line-out turnover. Henshaw busting straight into the line. And then the offload. It was Sonny Bill Williams like pops it straight up close to the line. And then goes Keith Earls that close to the line. Very hard to stop even the first runner, let alone off an offload. And Keith Earls finished that spectacularly. And that was the kickstart that we thought Ireland needed. But in the end, it really didn't push them onto anything. It gave them a nice buffer. And they really lived off that buffer for the rest of the match as well. With that conversion by Sexton, it put them out to a 7-point lead, 10 points to 3. But the Italians would not go away. And a couple minutes later, Tommaso Allen did not leave them alone. He kept annoying them. And he got another penalty, a second of the match, to make it 10-6. And once again, it was game on. The rocks in this match were absolutely fierce. There was plenty of fighting and jostling for the ball in the breakdown. Two teams, Ireland, I think, played anywhere near their best. And Italy, you have to say, were fairly decent in this game. And it made for a nice even contest, especially at the breakdown, where there was some big talent on both sides. Yeah, Omahani O'Brien and he slipped up against Minto Favaro and Parise, of course. They were the two back rows, and they were going absolute bananas in the rucks, trying to secure the ball both ways. It was flying all over the place, and it made for some... Some may say not so interesting for especially Irish fans, but from a neutral perspective, it was quite a close matchup. As we near the half-time break, it was Italy who were really under the pump, and they have to commend their defensive work here. For 13 phases, Ireland were on the attack 10 metres out from the Italian line, but somehow they held on to the, their line, and eventually they got a penalty to relieve pressure. Now, that is a long time to hold out an attack in a back line like Ireland had. Italy was starting to gain control of the scrums as well, which, as always, is a big part. The team that is controlling the scrums, getting the incentive over the breakdown, is a team that normally starts to gain control of the match. With that, Italy, I think, were just starting to nudge it out as the better side from the first half. Just their defensive ability, how well they defended their line for the most part of that match, especially the later part of the first half. Keith Thurl's got a chance just for the break to double his try scoring feat for the match, but his final pass to set up the two on one overlap just went off the mark, and as a result, the try was bombed once again. The two teams went to the break 10 points to 6. Ireland hanging on to a slender four-point lead. Italy weren't interested in bonus points for losing this one within seven as they were taking their penalty kicks or their penalties. They were kicking for touch inside the Irish 22. They were really looking for that try. They would put them and boost them into the lead and make them a, a real good chance to hold on to win this match, but they just could not put that final pass, that final move into the end goal to score the try. The chances were just not being converted and Ultimately, in the end, Italy were throwing away three-point opportunities that could have changed the result of this match. But it didn't take too long after that before the Italian defence once again was under the pump on their own line. But somehow, they did the unthinkable and held on once again, drawing another penalty to escape what seemed to be another certain try for Ireland. But as it looked like Ireland might score that decisive try, it was the Italians that got the biggest chance of the second half. It was a big try saver from Sean O'Brien up against Ferno. The second rower almost going into the corner. Joshua Ferno, a great try. Probably you could say he went a little too wide, a little too early. Could have taken the tackle, used the momentum to get himself over. But O'Brien's tackle just took him, his boot, onto the chalk before he grounded the ball. How decisive would have that try possibly been if he could have got that ball down first? There was nothing between these two sides, and it was something like that that was going to be the winning and the losing of this match. 
the Italian attack definitely built up the pressure later on as well as they did get another chance to add some more points. Tommaso Allen on the money once again and he put the score on up to 10 points to 9. It was just one point in it. Ireland's lead was slender and their fans were chewing on their nails. It was nerve-wracking stuff for the Irish fans as they thought they could be in line for another great World Cup upset. But Ireland do what they do, Bell, and they hit back, taking their chance through, you know, one of the best fly halves in world rugby. Jonathan Sexton nails another penalty goal back for Ireland six minutes later on to put the lead back out to four. 13-9 was the score. Now you think about how many kicks into touch the Italians took when they could have taken the three points. The penalties, though, were letting Ireland and Italy, for that matter, off the hook, especially when the pressure was coming on for one side or the other. We see multiple times that Ireland were camped in the Italians 22 and they managed to give away a penalty and let the other side escape and start to account back. Ireland were just kicking everything away. They wanted to play territory and the more the match went on, the more that tactic became very real and they will just thumping everything, looking to the defence to hang on and win this match. In the final 10 minutes, just 9 minutes remained in the match, it was a yellow card. Another yellow card. Don't be surprised. This time, it was Omahini who got a yellow into a ruck. Shoulder first, no arms in the clean out. Yellow card. We've seen a lot of them in the recent time as well. Silly thing to do. And a yellow card, which that really opened the door for the Italians. The score was 6 9 There were 7 points in it. Do we have a converted try for Italy? to bring that match back to level piggings and possibly a great escape for the Italians. But if anything, all that did was put Ireland even more into the shell and really kick them into shut-up shop gear as they just held their ball for long, long periods of time. No real intention to go too far forward, although obviously you don't want to go backwards. But any ball that they did give to the Italians, they could not put anything together. And the ball, for the final few minutes, was just held in green jumpers. The Irish were just doing everything they could to retain the ball, keep it in control of their own side, and they knew that they would hang on unless something miraculous happened. The Italians, all they could really look for was an intercept, but in the end they couldn't even find that. The final score did peter all the way out to 16-9. to The Italians could not add to that, and in the end the Irish did hang on to pull out a very messy victory, but like they say, and have been quoted about this match, you don't always play the beautiful game. You don't always play the beautiful, you know, wide expanse of rugby that you want to play and score thousands of points. Sometimes you have to win ugly. And that is what Ireland did here against Italy. They weren't the best. They weren't, you know, at the top of their game. In fact, their opponents probably played better than them, but they won. And at the end of the day, winning is what matters. When they look forward to their game against France this weekend, they'll probably think, well, we need to improve um, dramatically if we're going to stand a chance against the French because you don't want to finish second in this pool because the loser plays the All Blacks. Now, although both France and Ireland do have a good chance of beating the All Blacks, it's just not the quarterfinal you want. It's just not the game you want to come up against. You prefer to come up against Argentina, which, to be fair, back the other way, Argentina could easily beat France and or Ireland as well. So quarterfinals are looking absolutely mouthwatering heading into next week as well. We have some big matches coming up, though, into this final weekend that are going to decide final places. You know, Ireland got the win here, 16-9. Scrappy, messy, not the best to watch, but it was tough, and they got the win, which is the final matter, the final point that they really want to put away from this day. So that wraps us up here for day 13 of the Rugby World Cup. Wins for Ireland and wins for Argentina. That is what they'll want. That is what they'll take back. And they will both be looking forward to their final games of pool play. Of course, Ireland had the toughest of all. Up against France to decide who will take that top spot. Argentina will close out their tournament with an easy victory as well when they take on Namibia for their final match. An easy win and they should 
pretty much have already secured second place in Pool C. So from these matches, we'll just have a quick recap of where these two pools stand. Of course, in Pool C, it is the All Blacks that are leading the way. Argentina come into second place. Four points ahead of Tonga, but it's hard to imagine that Tonga will get a bonus point win over the All Blacks and Argentina will lose to Namibia. So that one is pretty much wrapped up in Pool D. It is Ireland and France all tied up on 14 points. Ireland with points differential getting them top spot for now, but that will be a big one to decide the winner of that pool. Of course, Italy, Romania and Canada sit down further on the ladder as they play out for, I don't know, the fun of it, the respect of their country and being at the Rugby World Cup. So that wraps up today for today's what the ruck happened. A little look at the two matches from day 13. Um, let me know, of course, what you all think about the games as well. Your opinions, your thoughts, who you thought played well from those two matches. And I'm really interested to see who you think is going to win between France and Ireland. That I think that's a 50-50. I'm being impressed by France, but we know that Ireland is probably the better side between the two. It's going to be an absolute cracker for that one. We have some big matches coming up as well over the next week. Tomorrow, as I mentioned earlier, Canada, Romania, Fiji, Uruguay are our two matches. Then it seems to be the, the bit of a trend at the moment, isn't there? Two matches a day. South Africa against the USA. Namibia, Georgia. That'll be a cracker. I'm quite excited to see that one. I think, hopefully, Namibia could maybe make a match of that Hopefully, but I think the Georgia's ultimately will be too strong. And then the big ones coming into the weekend. The All Blacks, Tonga, not so big, but Samoa, Scotland. Really looking forward to that. Australia, Wales, another one. I will definitely be getting up in the wee smalls to tune in for that and being as awake as possible. England and Uruguay round out that day as well. A match not many people probably care too much about anymore. But for today, a little look at those two matches. My time is complete. Thank you for tuning and watching. Leave your comments below what you think. Hit that subscribe button if you're loving the What The Rock happened. And I'll see you all next time. Until then, take care.